Good morning and welcome to episode 62 of Mystery, Murder, and Magic. As you may know, today we'll be doing the final episode of our Roaring 1920s miniseries. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to this miniseries as much as I've enjoyed bringing it to you. Just to give you all a little rundown of what we've talked about, the first week we talked about the Fatty Arbuckle scandal and the murder that he was accused of and then later acquitted of. Now, the death that happened that led him to being accused of murder was that of Virginia Rapp. But evidence from her autopsy revealed that in the past, she had suffered from several injuries to her abdominal area, and that, coupled with her apparent alcoholism, led to her death. On the following Monday, which was Valentine's Day, we talked about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It centered around the bootlegging wars in Chicago, and two of our main mobsters in that episode was Al Capone and Bugs Moran. Now, the massacre happened at a a garage in Chicago that was basically the front for Moran's bootlegging business. Seven men were gunned down and killed that day, and although it was always believed that Capone was responsible for the massacre, it was never proven, and the case was never solved. And last week, we talked about prohibition and speakeasies. Speakeasies started popping up all over the U.S. after the 18th Amendment outlawed alcohol sales unless it was for medicinal or religious purposes. That amendment, in the long run, ended up having a negative effect that lawmakers didn't expect. So in the early 1930s, it was repealed. And that brings us to this week's episode. So let's get it started. It's Monday, and that means it's time for a new episode of Mystery, Murder, and Magic. And here's your host. Andrea Lee and sometimes Alex. All right, y'all. Today we're going to be talking about a crime that to this day remains unsolved. It happened on September the 16th, 1920. And this event left more than 30 people dead and over 300 injured. So what was this event? It was the Wall Street bombing. The lunchtime rush was just getting started that day, so there was a lot of people everywhere. And in the hustle and bustle, an unknown man drove a horse-drawn cart through the traffic there on Wall Street. When he got in front of the U.S. USA building, which stood directly across the street from the J.P. Morgan building, and that's near the corner of Wall Street and Bond Street, he stopped the horse, left the cart, the horse and the cargo on the cart where it all stood and disappeared into the crowd. In just mere minutes, the cart exploded into millions of pieces, launching shrapnel in all directions. Immediately, those 30 people that I mentioned earlier were killed, but as the day wore on, the death toll, the death toll continued to rise, and that final number was 38 dead. The explosion was heard for miles around the area. The streets were filled with smoke and covered with shattered glass from the buildings that were directly hit by the explosion. Along with other debris from the buildings and bodies of the injured and dead, even parts of the horse that had pulled the cart were found a hundred yards away. The nearby New York Stock Exchange was immediately closed, and interestingly, the father of a future president, which was John F. Kennedy, and this is his dad, Joseph, was actually lifted off of his feet in the explosion because he was apparently in that area. 
Now, no one knew who this man had been that left the explosive car there in the lunchtime rush. And I'm quite certain that back in those days, acts of terrorism like that weren't as common or as heard of as they are now. And back in those days, they didn't analyze every single piece of evidence, so the scene was cleaned up overnight. And that included some very critical evidence that may have helped solve this case. Or at least, you know, it you know, could have at least been saved and then maybe with today's forensic technology they would more than likely be able to, you know, put this case to a closing, you know. But anyway, despite that they had thrown everything away, the local authorities, the Bureau of of Investigation, which is now the FBI, and the U.S. Secret Service was on this case trying to figure out who had caused this catastrophe and why. Hundreds of people who had been in the area before, during, and after the attack were interviewed, and even though so many people had been talked to, very few leads were developed from those interviews. Anyone who had seen the driver of that cart couldn't give a detailed description of him. And you know, it's probably because when they saw him, he probably just was like anybody else on the street. They didn't think a whole lot of him at first because he just pretty much blended in with the day-to-day, everyday traffic. And the New York Police Department was able to reconstruct the bomb and its fuse, but no one could agree on the type of explosive that had been used to make the bomb go off. And adding to that disagreement was the fact that a lot of common items used to make a bomb explosive was readily available. But there's some conflict and evidence on that. Because according to the Britannica Encyclopedia's article about that day, it was found that the bomb had been packed with iron window sash weights and TNT, and it was detonated by a timer. So like with any case from history, there's conflict and information out there. And the information about the fact that it couldn't be agreed on what the bomb had been packed with came from the FBI's website. Now, a few days before the bombing, a mail carrier found four flyers that had poor spelling and the printing was not that great of quality. A group called the American Anarchist Fighters had these printed and they were demanding the release of political prisoners. These flyers could be a big clue in solving who had did this bombing, but even though investigators searched up and down the eastern seaboard, they were unable to find any trace of information on who had them printed. These flyers were very similar to ones that had been found the year before when two other bombings took place under the direction of Italian anarchists. Now, because these flyers were similar to those that year before, investigators soon suspected followers of Italian anarchist leader Luigi Gallini, but officials couldn't prove it, so that basically went nowhere, and those anarchists soon fled from the U.S., so the case soon went cold. You know, many times we read about this group or that group claiming responsibility for bombings and other acts of terrorism, but in this case, no one at all claimed responsibility, not a soul. Now, one suspect that authorities came up with was a guy named Edwin P. Fisher. He was a lawyer, a champion tennis player, and he was frequently a patient at mental hospitals. Sometime before the bombing, he had predicted that an explosion would take place in the Wall Street area in mid-September. He mentioned in his letters to friends, and even when he had conversations with complete strangers, he brought this up. But when his location was checked out on September the 16th, it was found that he had been in Canada. And that prediction about the explosion he made was dismissed by investigators, and they just called it a delusion that was really just a coincidence. Other suspects were arrested, but one by one, you know, they were dismissed. Some of them were deported back to their home countries, but nobody was ever charged with the crime. And maybe strangest of all, it seems like it was just swept under the rug. The investigation was officially dropped in 1940. There was never a memorial built to remember those killed in the blast. And to me, that's just odd. You know, it just seems like there would be something to commemorate it. But anyway, 
1944, the FBI decided to reopen the case and conclude that the explosion had likely, and likely being the key word here, been the work of either Italian anarchist or Italian terrorist. Now, some investigators thought that a man by the name of Mario Bada was more than likely behind the attack because they thought that the act was revenge for the indictment of two of his associates. Nicola Sacco and Bartholomeo Vanzetti, they had been indicted for a murder that was a robbery gone wrong. And y'all get this, their indictment happened on September the 11th, 1920. September the 11th. I don't know. That just seems a bit sus- suspicious, but I ain't trying to start like a conspiracy theory here. But anyway, that's just my opinion. Now, Butta was never arrested or charged because he fled to Italy where he lived out the rest of his life. And I guess back in those days, extradition wasn't something that they did. I'm pretty sure that the driver of that car wasn't the mastermind of the whole thing. It was probably just his job to deliver death. And maybe he had been killed also. I mean, it's quite possible that he hadn't even gotten far enough away from the scene before the bomb was detonated. Now, until the federal building bombing in Oklahoma some 75 years later, this bombing on Wall Street was the deadliest terrorist attack in the United States. So even though they concluded it was likely carried out by Italian terrorists or anarchists, it's still a cold case in my opinion because no one was ever arrested and charged with a crime. To this day, there are still scars from the explosion on the J.P. Morgan building. Now, to me, it just seems that somebody had to see or know something. I mean, there was a composite sketch released of what they thought the driver of the cart looked like, but he was never identified. I guess this is just one of those things in life that we may never know answers to. All right, that's it for today's episode and the end of this mini-series. I really appreciate each and every one of you that download episodes and have subscribed to our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, a link to our YouTube channel is in the episode description. Y'all have a great week. Don't forget to come back Wednesday for the midweek mini. 